So uh, good afternoon for those who are in France and good morning to those who are uh, in New York. Uh, thank you for coming to my PhD defense. During my PhD, uh, I have worked on forecasts of dynamical systems from analogs with applications to geophysical variables and a special focus uh, on ocean waves. So there is uh, a demand for forecasts coming from the industry of offshore renewable energy. For instance, if you think of a wind turbine, it is important to forecast the production of energy from this wind turbine. And to do so, one has to forecast the wind uh, in the next hours. And this is the object of the ANR project Caraville. Also, for installation and maintenance purposes, uh, it is necessary to forecast the wind, waves, and rain in the next days in order to find the fair weather conditions that allow these installation and maintenance. If these fair weather conditions cannot be met, then it is necessary to uh, forecast extreme waves in the next minutes um, in case where maintenance is performed uh, in uh, intermediate sea states where some uh, strong waves can, uh, can come because this forecast of extreme waves allows to trigger some special security procedure. And uh, in some uh, special weather situation, uh, the wind turbine must be turned off. Uh, for instance, if there is too much wind, uh, there might be too much energy production, and uh, this is detrimental for the uh, energy distribution. So the wind turbine must be turned off in case of extreme wind. Also, uh, extreme rain, rain can damage the blades of the wind turbine. And in this case, uh, turning the wind turbine off can help to mitigate this damage. And in all these applications, in all these type of forecasts, the lead time, so the time uh, at which uh, the forecast is requested, is very short. It is uh, minutes uh, to days, which is very different from uh, months and years in terms of atmospheric and uh, oceanic time. So it is very short term uh, forecasts. So to meet this demand for forecasts, there are some special tools which uh, are used at uh, IMT Atlantique and also at LCE. Uh, for instance, uh, analog forecasting is the object, well, analogs are the object of the Euro European project A2C2. And uh, analog forecasting uh, is a data-driven forecast tool. So it is an alternative to model-driven methods in uh, most situations, uh, forecasts of ge geophysical variables are done based on models, which gives a physical uh, description of the system. But here, analog forecasting relies only on data. Uh, I will show here an example of the principle of analog forecasting, but I will talk about it in more details later. You can see here uh, the state of the system. And here is the time at which we want to make a forecast. And uh, analogs of this state are searched in a database called the catalog. And the successors of these analogs give a list of possible futures. So uh, it is uh, called an ensemble forecast, and uh, it allows to assess the probability of future events, which is interesting because it does not only give the most probable future state, but also a list of all possible, uh, of possible future states. And also, uh, it has the advantage compared to model-driven methods uh, to be very fast uh, uh, to run uh, numerically. Okay. So everything that I have done uh, in my PhD can be related to the question how to optimally forecast geophysical variables for the sake of marine renewable energy activities. During my PhD, I have focused first on uh, ocean surface waves, then uh, on wind-related uh, processes and on rain-related processes. Most of my work was dedicated to methodological aspects. Um, for ocean surface waves, I have started with uh, designing a forecast scheme, a model-driven forecast scheme. So here it was based on uh, a physical description, 
uh, to try to forecast the next extreme waves using only crest velocities. And then most of my PhD was dedicated to a data-driven uh, forecast scheme called analogs. And I applied uh, this method to uh, ocean waves, wind, and I started applying it to uh, rain-related processes. So um, to test these uh, methods, model-driven and data-driven, I have mostly used idealized mathematical systems. So they are uh, mathematical equations uh, and systems which bear similar properties to these uh, real uh, geophysical uh, variables. And uh, uh, also, uh, especially to test the methods of analogs, I have used uh, observational data coming from uh, uh, wave bureau for the sea uh, surface elevation. Uh, I have used an aroma reanalysis, which I will talk about uh, later. And uh, I would like uh, in the future to use uh, real data for rain-like processes. And in this presentation, I will only talk about analogs, uh, analog distances, analog forecasts, and I will only show uh, data coming from the Lawrence system of 1963 and from the Arome reanalysis, which I will introduce uh, in, the, in, the, in the next slides. So this is the, the uh, table of content of this presentation. We are now in the middle of the introduction. I will finish by giving some generalities on analogs. And in my uh, first part, I will talk about analog to target distances. And in a second part, about analog forecasting. And then I will conclude. So to introduce to you uh, some of the notions that are useful for uh, understanding analogs, I want to show you examples using uh, data from a reanalysis. And what I will show you are wind at 10 meter altitude above the sea surface uh, off the coast of Brittany. So they come from a reanalysis. So it is uh, the the mixture of a regional climate model and of observations. So here is a map of uh, wind velocity. You can see that uh, it comes from uh, 4 o'clock on the 19th of December 2019. And uh, at this date, at this moment in time, the wind was blowing mostly uh, north-northeast. And the wind velocity was uh, between 20 knots and uh, 30 knots. OK, now the question is, uh, <coughs> If this uh, reanalysis of hourly data from 2015 to 2019 is my catalog, this is my database, and if I want to make a forecast of the future, so 5 o'clock, uh, et cetera, on the same day in 2019, I assume that this is my target, and I want to find analogs uh, of this target. So first, can I find analogs in this uh, reanalysis catalog? The answer uh, is yes. So um, the analogs are uh, ranked by uh, increasing Euclidean distance. So uh, here, the first analog is the closest uh, matching wind map from the reanalysis. So the best analog of our target is uh, 10 o'clock on the 25th of December 2017. And I also show the 10th and the 30th analog. And uh, what you can see here is that we can find many analogs uh, in this reanalysis. And uh, also that uh, these analogs all look uh, by eye uh, fairly uh, good analogs of our target. And it is not so easy to see that this analogs is closer to the real target in terms of distance than the 10th analog and the 30th analog. So the system has some recurrence uh, property. And now if I want to forecast the future, if I want, uh, if I assume that I don't know this future and I'm using uh, successors to make this forecast, we can see that the successors uh, uh, still uh, are close to the, the real future state. So there is some dynamical uh, stability. If the analogs are close to the target, the successors will stay close to the real future state. If we go uh, two hours ahead, we start to see a, a slow, small uh, divergence of the successors. And uh, if we look then 12 hours ahead, the successors uh, are all different from each other and from the future state. So you can already see here 
that uh, these successors give an ensemble of possible future state. And this allows to make a probabilistic estimation of the future possible states. Uh, of course, uh, we cannot forecast this state using these successors, but since they are all different, we are also aware that the analog forecast uh, will not uh, give a, an accurate, uh, precise representation of the future state. Okay. Now, um, so analog methods have been used uh, since the 19, uh, since 1969 by Edward Lawrence uh, to study atmospheric predictability. Um, and uh, analog methods have many advantages. They do not rely on a physical model. Uh, sometimes a physical representation is not available. And uh, also a, a physical model can be uh, uh, slow as we will, uh, yes, it can be slow to compute on a computer. Uh, analog uh, methods are fast thanks to uh, recent machine learning libraries. It is very fast to go and search for the uh, best analogs. And also, as, as I have uh, showed you, uh, it gives a, uh, an, an ensemble of possible states. So it allows to perform statistical tasks, which can be uh, very useful. And there are many applications of analog methods. I will uh, uh, talk in my second part about uh, the application of analog forecasting, but there are many different uh, applications. And especially the first part of my presentation can be applied to any uh, analog methods. So the scientific question that I, will, that I will try to answer in this presentation is how and when do simple forecasts based on analogs accurately estimate the future state of a system? And it can be subdivided into two questions. Can we find good analogs? This will be my first part. And can the future be estimated from the successors of these good analogs? And this will be my second part. So, uh, in this first part, I will try to answer the question, how far from the target are the analogs? Uh, previous studies uh, on uh, this topic tried to answer a slightly different question. The question was, how long must we wait to find one good analog? So how long refers to return time statistics. And the, the question that uh, was tried to be answered was, uh, uh, how many years of data do we need to find a good analog? Do we need two years, 10 years, 100 years? How many years do we need? So why uh, did they ask this question? Uh, and in the first studies, for instance, the study of Lawrence uh, on analogs, a uh, few observational data was available, uh, usually less than 20 years of records. And uh, the original studies focused on very large dimensional systems. So systems with a large number of degrees of freedom, systems that need a large, numbers or a large number of variables to be described. And the conclusion uh, that you can find in Lawrence's uh, initial paper is that uh, he says we can find uh, numer numerous mediocre analogs, but no truly good ones. So uh, when Van den Dol asked uh, how long must we wait to find one good analog, he was trying to answer a very pessimistic uh, uh, conclusion. And here is an example, uh, also uh, from a uh, book of Van den Doel. Uh, and here uh, are the best uh, analogs from 36 years of records uh, in the southern uh, hemisphere of a atmospheric circulation. And you can already see uh, from these two uh, analogs that uh, although they do look uh, like each other, uh, there are some differences and uh, it is uh, much different from the examples that we saw uh, earlier of the wind data where the analogs were really uh, um, similar to each other. So the answer of Van den Doel was uh, to find one analog with precision epsilon, uh, the catalog size, so the number of years uh, that one must wait, uh, must be greater or equal to one over epsilon to the power d, where d is the dimension of the system. So the catalog size, the minimum catalog size, grows exponentially with the dimension, such that in very high dimension, this catalog size uh, can reach uh, very high numbers. Uh, for instance, if one wants to find uh, uh, 
uh, analogs within observational error uh, one analog within ob observational error uh, for uh, a geopotential uh, height field over the whole northern hemisphere, which is what Lawrence tried to do in 1969, one would have uh, to have 10 to the power 30 years of data. So it's a, a very large amount of data. We chose to answer a, a slightly different question. We focused on distance statistics of the best analogs uh, because today uh, more data is available uh, for atmospheric processes. Uh, it is um, uh, most of the time people have access to more than 50 years of observation. And also people, people are aware of this uh, dimensionality issue. So uh, scientists usually focus on low dimensional systems to use analogs. Also in practice, it is impossible to wait longer. Uh, if you have 10 years of data, uh, it is not very informative to you to know that you would have needed 100 years of data. What you want to know is what can I do with my 10 years of data? And so what you want to know is how far from the target will the analogs be? And uh, lastly, maybe the most important part uh, is that uh, uh, Ensemble tasks, as I showed you before, uh, if you want to perform an ensemble forecast to have a list of possible futures, you need multiple analogs. And in many applications of analogs, you need not just one good analog, but many good analogs. So this is also a, a change of point of view. We did not focus not uh, just on the first analog. So. The answer to the question, how far from the target are the analogs, is statistical. And I want to show you here an example so that you understand why the answer is statistical. Um, so if you have uh, catalogs that are different, but have the same catalog size, and if you look for analogs of the same target, you will find different analogs. And I will show you an example here. Uh, using So I will use the Lorentz uh, system. Uh, it is a mathematical system of uh, three variables, so it is low dimensional. Um, it is a uh, simplified convection model, and it has the properties of atmospheric processes. Uh, it is a chaotic system, so it has this divergence property, uh, which we witnessed uh, with the wind data. And also it has an attractor, so it has this recurrence property of atmospheric processes. So here is a, a first example of a catalog uh, that was built using this Lawrence system. Uh, here in gray, you can see the catalog. So it uh, uh, goes through this butterfly attractor. And uh, here in black is the target state. And uh, if we zoom in here, uh, we can see again the target state. And here are the analogs. You can see the first one, the second one, etc., up to the 10th best analogs of this target state from this catalog. And I will say now that this uh, catalog is uh, the catalog number one, and it uh, would uh, uh, imagine that it corresponds to 10 years of data, but starting in uh, 1980. Now, uh, if I uh, uh, simulate another catalog, but starting from a different initial condition, so maybe starting in 1990, but still 10 years, you can see that the catalog uh, still covers the attractor, but it is a little bit different from the catalog that we saw earlier. And uh, even though we're looking at the same target state and the catalog has the same size, uh, it is still 10 years of data, the analogs are different, and you can already see uh, that the analogs seem to be a little bit uh, more far away than in the previous example, especially the first and uh, second, third analogs. And again, uh, another catalog with uh, still the same number of data, uh, and still uh, the catalog is slightly different, but it does uh, show the attractor, and still the analogs are different. So for a same catalog size and a same target, uh, analogs can be different, so analog to target distance will vary. And since they vary, the answer to the question, how far will the analogs be, is statistical. Okay, so 
um, from a, a paper that has been uh, recently submitted to the Journal of Atmospheric Sciences, uh, we have given full probability distributions uh, of analog to target distances. Here I will only show the first moments of uh, this, uh, these distributions, and I will use uh, the following notations. Rk is the kth analog to target distance. K is the analog rank, so the first analog uh, K equal one, for the second analog K equals two, etc. L is the size of the catalog, so it's the number of years that we have, if you want. And D is the dimension of the system. So the average uh, Kth analog to target distance is approximately equal to this uh, from uh, our theory. And uh, the first term that you see here with the one over L to the power one over D is uh, absolutely consistent with the results from uh, Van den Duel. If you want uh, R1 to be below epsilon, then uh, L has to be greater or equal to one over epsilon to the power D. So we recover the results from Van den Duel, but what is new here is that we have this uh, k to the power 1 over d, so it shows that rk is a growing function of k, this is logical, the second analog is more far away than the first one, etc. But we also see that the growth depends on the dimension, and the growth will be fast in small dimension and very slow uh, in uh, high dimension. And I will show you an example of uh, what uh, uh, kind of consequences this has for practical applications. Now, if we look at the standard deviation uh, of this uh, analog to target distance, we still have this uh, one over L to the power one over D. And uh, we have here um, a different dependency uh, on K. So for dimensional uh, uh, greater than two, it is a decreasing function of K. For dimension uh, lower than two, it is an increasing function of K. Uh, and for D equals two, it is almost uh, independent of K. And uh, if we take these expressions, 2 and 3, with the limit d goes to infinity, uh, rk tends to 1 in average, and the standard deviation tends to 0. So that means that in very large dimension, all the analogs will almost surely be as far uh, from the target state as any other uh, random state. Uh, so that means that it is consistent with the idea that in high dimension, in very high dimension, it is uh, useless to search uh, for analogs. Okay, now uh, these statistics are very interesting, but do they fit reality? Because they're based on several hypotheses. Um, here, uh, we performed experiment of the Lorentz system that I showed you uh, earlier from 1963. Uh, so in these numerical simulations, we use uh, only one target point, just as the examples that I showed before, but uh, 600 different catalogs, which allows to build empirical probability distributions. And we used uh, three different types, uh, three different values of the catalog size. And here are the results. You can see the probability densities uh, at the function of the uh, rescaled distances. So uh, what is important here is that R is rescaled with this L to the power one over D, uh, which we saw earlier was the, the scaling factor with L. And uh, you can see that uh, in black uh, are the empirical probability distributions for the first, 10th, and 30th analog. And uh, you can see that Changing L uh, does not change uh, much the shape of the empirical distribution. So this scaling with the catalog size is respected. And also uh, the probability distributions that we find uh, empirically are consistent with the theoretical curves for a dimension close to two. Okay. Uh, and now, if we want to see if the, these uh, are applicable to real systems with a uh, high dimension and a real geophysical system, we can use this Arome reanalysis. So in this case, uh, we cannot take just one target and make different catalogs because we only have one catalog and we cannot generate more and it is of limited size. So uh, what we did is that we merged different target points. 
but to obtain probability distributions from different points, we had to rescale the distances so that they have a zero mean and a variance one. And we did this rescaling using the formulas two and three that I showed you before for the average and standard deviation. And here are the results. Uh, the theoretical curves that we should uh, obtain from this rescaled uh, uh, analog to target distances are here uh, for the first, second, third, up to the eighth analog. And uh, here are the empirical curves that we get from our uh, 10 meter wind data. Uh, what you can see here is that the empirical curve uh, do match the the shape of uh, the theoretical curves. Uh, they also match the, the mean. Our rescaling to have a zero mean using our formula uh, seems to work because these empirical curves do have a zero mean, but uh, they have a slightly uh, smaller variance than uh, they should have in theory. So uh, it means that our formula is slightly uh, uh, overestimate the variance uh, of uh, uh, analog to target distances and we interpret this fact uh, by saying that our formulas are valid in the limit of L tends to infinity, so in the limit of very large catalog, and uh, in this case the catalog is probably not large enough for this limit to be perfectly uh, valid. But still we, have, we are happy with how the observational data fit uh, the theory. Now, how can these results be used? Well, uh, one question that uh, comes up uh, almost every time when one is using analog methods is how many analogs should I use? Should I use 10 analogs, 20 analogs, 50 analogs? It depends on the application. It depends on what you want to do. But what we can see from our, um, from our theoretical results is that if uh, one is looking at high dimensional systems, so for a dimension superior or equal to 15, for instance, uh, then as I said before, the growth of uh, RK with K in average is very slow. So for instance, here for D equals 15, R50 is only 30% higher than R1. And it is consistent with uh, what we saw in the example of the wind data, if you remember. The wind data, uh, we estimate it to have a dimension close to 13. And we saw that the first, the 10th, and the 30th analog were all looking uh, pretty good analog of our target. So in high dimension, you can use uh, uh, many analogs. It should not uh, change much the analog to target distance. But in low dimension, for instance, for a dimension of two, uh, the 50th analog to target distance is uh, 600 times uh, higher in average than the first analog to target distance. So you might want to be more careful in, in a small dimension. Also, uh, the previous studies were focusing on just the objective that the first analog to target distance is smaller than a given threshold. Now you can uh, have expressions uh, for the kth analog to target distance, and that can allow you to uh, tune, for instance, uh, if uh, you are doing a dimension reduction with uh, having a certain objective of analog to target distance, you can do it uh, using our formula. Now that we have uh, good analogs, can we use it to make a forecast? And uh, the question now will be, how far from the future state are mean analog forecasts? So uh, Ridwan Elginsat et al. in 2017 introduced uh, some analog forecasting operators, so different strategies to make a forecast based on analogs. And uh, these operators have different performances, and there is a need for interpretation of these performances. So this will be our objective, how to interpret the difference in performance of these analog forecasting operators. Also, there have been uh, several other studies on the errors of analog forecast, which is what we will uh, uh, look at in this second part. And maybe the study which is the closest uh, to ours is the one by Farmer and Sidorovich from 1988. So um, here I will show you these operators uh, that were introduced by Elgin Sat in 2017. Um, so, for all of these operators, the future state is estimated as a 
discrete distribution. So uh, as I showed you in the example with the wind data, the future is estimated as a list of possible future, okay? And each element of this distribution, each element of this list can be written as the sum of a successor plus a matrix S applied to the difference between the target and the analog. Now, uh, we will look at three different operators. And uh, for these three different operators, the matrix S takes three different values. For the locality constant, S equals zero. So the future uh, di discrete distribution only involves the successors. And here is an example. So uh, you can see here x0, which is the target initial state. xt is the future state. And you can see in black here the real trajectory of the system. You can see here the left, the right pointing uh, triangles are the analogs of x0. And here are the successors uh, of these analogs. And they allow to estimate the probability distribution of xt. Now, the locally incremental uh, has S equal I, where I is the identity matrix. So it adds uh, a, a correction to the successor, which is a difference between the target and the analog. And uh, uh, you can see here that for small times in the beginning, it seems to work very well. Those uh, trajectories, colored trajectories here are close to the real trajectory. And then they seem to diverge a little bit. And uh, we will try to answer, uh, to understand why uh, they do in the in the next uh, slide. And finally, the locally linear is uh, a, a third operator, and it uh, performs a local regression between the analogs and the successors. So it tries to understand the relationship between uh, the analogs and the successors uh, locally. And uh, so S is then given by this matrix, and here it seems to give the best uh, performances. It has a very low variance, and it does track the real uh, trajectory uh, very well. And all these operators are local, locally linear, locally incremental, locally constant, in the sense that they rely on the analogs, which are close to the target state. This is why they are called local. OK, so. Um, Taking several uh, hypotheses, we can uh, interpret these uh, relative performances of these operators. Um, the uh, hypothesis that uh, we take in this article, which uh, is now in revision process uh, for the same Journal of Atmospheric Sciences, uh, we assume that there is a deterministic model, phi t, a flow, phi t, which relates the uh, initial target state and the real future state, and that this model uh, also dictates the evolution of uh, analog uh, and, and successors. And we assume that this model has a tangent, a Jacobian here, uh, nabla of phi t, and we assume that uh, the analogs are perturbed by additive noise, which corresponds to uh, uh, observational noise. From these hypotheses, we find that the difference between the forecast and the real future is the sum of two terms. The first term depends on the difference between the Jacobian of the real flow and the matrix S, which depends uh, on the operator that we use. And uh, it is applied to the difference between the analog and the target. So you can see here that it depends on analog to target distances, which we were talking about in the previous section. And the second term depends on the observational noise, and it is left multiplied by the sum of the Jacobian matrix of the real flow and the identity matrix. And this formula is from uh, our paper. So um, here are results of numerical experiments using the uh, system of Lorentz from 1963. Uh, you can see here the error of forecast. So it is this uh, difference, the forecast uh, uh, minus the real future. Here is the lead time. And uh, we show here two cases. The first case is the case of strong noise. So what do we mean by strong noise? We mean that the noise here is uh, much stronger than the typical analog to target distance. And in this case, 
uh, what we observe is that the locally constant, locally incremental, and locally linear have very similar performances. The curves are uh, uh, impossible to distinguish, and we only show one here. So in the strong noise case, all operators have the same performance. You can use any operator, uh, it doesn't matter. And this is consistent with uh, our formula here, because uh, uh, if noise uh, is much stronger than analog to target distance, then this term is dominant, and this term does not depend on S. So it does not depend on which operator is used. Now, in the case of weak noise, we see differences between the three operators, because uh, if the noise here is weaker or comparable to the typical uh, analog to target distance, then this term will come into play, and this term depends on S, which depends on the operator. What you can see here for very small lead times is that uh, the locally incremental seems to have better performances than the locally constant. And this is what we saw also uh, in the previous figure. And that can be explained because in this term, uh, S equals zero for the locally constant and S equals I for the locally incremental. And for any uh, flow, for any Jacobian of a flow, the limit of this matrix when t tends to zero is the identity. So for when t tends to zero, for very small lead times, uh, this difference tends to zero when s equals i. So the locally incremental has a smaller term here, which is why it has better performances for small times. And for large times, uh, we can see that the locally incremental and locally constant have similar performances. This is because we are looking at a chaotic system. So uh, trajectories uh, that are initially small will diverge in time. So that uh, since S is constant for the locally incremental and locally constant, uh, this term here will be much larger than S for large times. And so locally inc incremental and constant have similar performances for large lead times. And finally, uh, the locally linear uh, has better performances at all times. And this is due to the fact that uh, it is what we showed also in the paper, uh, this matrix S does approximate uh, this uh, Jacobian. The linear regression between the analogs and the successors gives an estimation of this Jacobian matrix. So this term is even smaller for the locally linear. And finally, uh, we can also see on this um, on this figure, the results that are from the study of Farmer and Sidorovich, which uh, I uh, introduced earlier, uh, and th they show that the dependency with time of these curves must uh, uh, follow the maximal Lyapunov exponent. So the maximal Lyapunov exponent basically uh, drives the growth of perturbation uh, uh, in time with the system. So you can see here that the curve A, B, and C have a slope which is close to this one, which corresponds to the maximal Lyapunov exponent, and uh, curve D has a slope which is close to twice the Lyapu maximum Lyapunov exponent. Okay, so how can we use these results? Uh, we can use them to choose uh, the best method depending on time uh, horizon, noise intensity, and the number of analogs. And I want to stress again that analog forecasts allow to perform ensembles. So they give a list of possible futures, which allows to estimate confidence intervals. It gives a probabilistic uh, description of the future. And here, our contribution uh, gives another layer of confidence because it allows to derive error bounds for uh, forecast errors. OK. So how to optimally forecast geophysical variables for marine renewable energy activities? We have seen that uh, analog forecasting provides a data-based uh, type of uh, ensemble forecasts, which can be interesting in uh, certain situations. And uh, how and when do these simple forecasts based on analogs accurately estimate the future state of a system? From our contribution, we can see that there is a, a three-way relationship between uh, the quality of analogs, the catalog size, the analog rank, and the dimension of the system. And this uh, relationship that we showed can be used to tune uh, analog methods. Uh, also, uh, we interpreted uh, analog forecasting uh, errors for these different operators, which allows to choose uh, which operator to use. 
and it also provides error bounds, so guarantees uh, on the fact that uh, the forecast from analogs uh, does converge to the real future state, uh, which also depends on the what we showed in the first part, which is that uh, the analogs do uh, uh, converge to the, the, the target in the limit of large catalog. So the work uh, that has been uh, presented in this presentation uh, will be used in the future. Uh, it will be used uh, to update a online Python uh, library for the analog data assimilation, which was uh, introduced by uh, Elgensat uh, in uh, 2017. It will also be used um, to provide a wind forecasts, wind analog forecast in the Caravel project, uh, which uh, I introduced earlier, and also in future projects at uh, France Energy Marine. Also, a part of my work, which I could not show you today, um, but I uh, did mention it in the beginning, was dedicated to uh, extreme ocean waves and uh, the a forecast scheme uh, that I developed uh, will be used in the future to try and perform extreme wave uh, forecasts in the short term based on uh, these kind of images uh, that are uh, available from the Helmholtz Centrum uh, Gestat. So the, the waves that will hit the, the this point here will be uh, forecasted by looking at waves at the limit of uh, uh, the observation. Okay. Um, to conclude, uh, I think that analogs have uh, many advantages for some practical applications. Uh, as we have seen, they provide uh, end symbols of possible states. Uh, they are model free, they're interpretable, they are uh, fast, etc. So they can be used for applications thanks to uh, these advantages. But what I find very interesting is that they also help to understand the properties of geophysical systems. Studying analogs allows to uh, better know the system in terms of recurrences, recurrences, also in terms of dimension, in terms of predictability, etc. So it can be used uh, to produce forecasts, for instance, but also to understand the system at stake. Uh, so to, to use analogs optimally, uh, I think uh, there are still uh, some work which needs to be done. Uh, for instance, uh, I have focused in, the, in this presentation on uh, mean analog forecasts, only on mean analog forecasts. But I also said to you that what is very interesting with analogs is that they can provide ensemble of possible states. So I think... Uh, uh, there should be more research on these uh, properties of uh, the ensembles of analogs, uh, especially there are different types of uh, variability when uh, talking about uh, analogs and analog forecasts. There is a variability among the successors. Uh, we saw earlier that the first, uh, 10th and 30th successor are different. This is a, a one type of variability. There is also, uh, we have seen that uh, for 10 years of data, we can have different analogs depending on when, where we start. This was the second part. So this variability leads to uh, another type of forecast variability. And also there is a forecast error. And these three quantities are uh, different, but they have relationship, which to my knowledge uh, are not uh, fully uh, understood in, in theory. And I think uh, it is an important lead to follow. Uh, uh, for the, the same, um, in the same direction, uh, you in 2014 is performing iterative analog forecasts. So here in this presentation, I showed only forecasts using analogs and successors, but from those successors, you can again find analogs and use these successors. So you're performing ensembles of ensembles. And uh, this uh, I think uh, should also be studied from a dynamical systems perspective to better understand how this works. Also, uh, a very important point is uh, also a question that is uh, asked uh, very often when uh, giving a presentation about analogs is, can you find analogs of extreme events? 
And uh, we have started to answer this question by using a formalism of uh, heavy tailed uh, random variables, but uh, it has to be continued. And finally, uh, uh, everything that I've showed in this presentation assumes that uh, the forecast will not work if the state of the system diverges. I said uh, that uh, two hours, uh, 12 hours uh, after uh, the, the analogs, we see that the successors are all different, so the state diverges, so we cannot make a forecast. But in practice, for some observables, such as, for instance, the wind at a precise uh, given location, uh, it, it might not be a problem that the state diverges. Maybe there is some stability for those observables. So this observables framework allows to really understand how analogs can be used uh, to produce forecasts, for instance, in practice. And I think that uh, what I have uh, done in my PhD should uh, be uh, interpreted also uh, in this uh, framework that was used uh, uh, in the studies that I show here. Okay. Thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you, Paul. Your time, time was uh, perfect. Uh, Thank so you. now it's time uh, for questions, and we'll start with the uh, reviewers. Uh, I propose to maybe start with uh, Julien Tuboul because I uh, guess that Dimitri Janakis is not as uh, is not usual to, to so listen I am, to I French. Am, uh, just taking off my my microphone so that everyone okay. can hear you uh, in the room. Uh, I am not sure. Okay, so I you. said that we can start uh, the questions with uh, uh, Julien Touboul. Uh, Julien so that Dimitri okay. uh, can have an example so how it uh, it happens in France <laughs> for the differences. Uh, uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I do. Either. Thank you very much. Uh, Pierre was uh, wondering if uh, we might take just a small break before the, the question, maybe five minutes. How uh, is that? Is that okay for everyone? Yeah. Or yeah, we can do it. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, we start again in five minutes. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay.
Okay, I have turned on my microphone and I am hearing myself. It is very perturbing. Yes. <laughs> uh, ah, how can we do that? Okay, uh, I will. Uh, when other people talk, uh, we will have to turn on the microphone of uh, Thierry's uh, computer. Our system is not very performant uh, right now, but I think uh, it will do. Okay, so okay. I would, uh, Valerie, yes. <coughs> so we can uh, start with a question. Okay, merci, Thierry. Well, so, shall I start? Yes, you can start. Okay. So, um, I will start with uh, a few comments. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be really here with you and to follow your presentation. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to read your manuscripts. Um, and I wanted to start by emphasizing that I had many pleasure reading it because uh, I'm not close to the field of analogs forecasting and to my surprise, I was able to follow uh, the discussions uh, without so much uh, difficulty. And this is probably, probably due to the fact that your manuscript was very clear and very pedagogical and Okay, I did manage to follow uh, your points and your demonstration. And it, this was really pleasant. Besides, um, you have many results in these documents, a lot of them. You chose, and you clearly explained that you chose not to present them all in this presentation. Uh, and you were able to put all these results together and to give a real continuity to the discussion, which also contributes to the, the pleasure I had to read this manuscript. Uh, the, I, I can make the same remark about your presentation. Uh, so you obviously had too many results to present everything here, and you probably made the only possible choice, which was to to do the hard cuts that had to be made and to just to be correct with these 45 minutes that you have to respect. I have to emphasize also that I'm a bit frustrated by your choices because uh, there were many interesting results that I would have liked to see in this presentation, but yet I understand that you, okay, well, it was the only choice and this I acknowledge. Uh, now that I made these uh, comments, uh, there are still some points that I had difficulties to understand, and maybe you can uh, you can um, try to help me in this way of uh, understanding that. Uh, some of them concerning what you just presented, and some of them. Uh, I, okay, I was really excited by, by the chapters you you did not present here. Maybe I will have one or two questions about these two, because uh, otherwise uh, I will not sleep in the coming night. <laughs> but anyway, uh, sh sh let's start with um, the, the first chapter you presented here, which is um, the distance of analogs to targets. For me, there is something that has not been totally clear, neither in your manuscript nor in this presentation, which is in fact what you call the dimension of the system. You are dealing with um, some dynamical system that have evolution in a physical space, which have its own dimension. And you're also dealing with catalogs of data, which have their own dimension. And for example, you come with the number 13 for your wing data. And my question is uh, very general. How, how is it important to, to 
consider this dimension. I understand that you, you are dealing now with the, the dimension from the data system, but obviously they do not match the physical dimension and the dimension of the system. So how is it important that these two dimensions should be close? Uh, for instance, in your belief, is it important that the, um, the catalog of data you are looking somehow testify from the physical dimension of the system? Or if they are truncated, uh, how do you expect to remain close when going to forecasting, for example, or either from uh, analog to target distance? OK. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your comment and for your questions. Um, I, I could not say uh, thank you directly because we had to, to turn off the, the, the microphone. Um, so uh, first, uh, yes, uh, regarding the, the, the choice for the presentation, I have to say that it was a hard choice uh, also for me. Uh, um, because uh, also for uh, friends, I was uh, talking about uh, waves uh, many times, and I know that some people would have liked me to talk uh, about waves, but uh, uh, I could not. And also uh, some other elements, uh, I would have loved to talk uh, about it, but I, I could not. Um, Regarding this um, this uh, first chapter on analog to target and uh, this uh, your question of dimension, um, so um, uh, first of all, uh, we could say uh, that for most uh, uh, real systems, the the dimension uh, the real dimension is actually uh, infinite. For instance, uh, if we think of uh, of uh, even of uh, waves uh, uh, wave elevation uh, at uh, one point, uh, we could say that to have a perfect uh, reconstruction uh, using a Fourier transform, for instance, uh, we would need an infinite number of uh, Fourier components. So this is an example. So in most situations, uh, you could say that the real system at stake, the real geophysical system at stake has an infinite dimension. Um, one thing that uh, we can say is that uh, still you can find um, um, reliable uh, 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 approximations of the system and of its dynamics uh, from uh, uh, lower dim finite dimensional uh, uh, systems. Uh, and from so so these will be up, uh, approximations of, of the the true systems when the when the dimension is finite um, then uh, so uh, you asked the question uh, how important it is that the dimension of the data that we're using um, uh, is close to the the, the, the real dimension uh, one thing that we can do that I could not show uh, uh, in this presentation is that uh, we can use uh, analogs or other procedures to try to estimate uh, the, the the dimension uh, of a system, assuming that it is uh, finite. Uh, uh, and uh, then, uh, for instance, so we estimate a dimension of 13 from uh, our uh, wind data. And... Uh, uh, how important is that? Is it that the date, that the dimension of the data uh, uh, meets the dimension of the real system? It depends on the application, uh, I guess. Uh, if you want to uh, be able to forecast everything in the future, uh, any any quantity that depends on the state of the system, then uh, the dimension of uh, uh, your data of or of how you transform your data uh, has to has to uh, be close to the, the the real system dimension as you could estimate it uh, uh, assuming that is it is finite but for other uh, uh, applications it may be uh, uh, only necessary to have uh, you can use lower order lower dimensional uh, representations. I, I, I'm uh, seeing now that I have been maybe uh, pretty long <laughs> in my answer. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, I hope I was uh, uh, clear in what I said. Uh, but maybe uh, you can ask me a question again. 
Yeah, yeah, yet there's something that is not fully clear to me. I'm sorry, it's because I'm not familiar with this way of presenting uh, the infinite dimension of data. I understand what you say from the data point of view, but yet you have a dynamical system which has an evolution equation with a finite number of uh, variables. So this can be, uh, for example, if I go to an atmospherical system, you have a four dimension of space and time, and then you will have the physical variables that are U, V, W, uh, maybe pressure, temperature, um, some of this data. And to, to be specific for your wind data, what I'm a bit surprised is that you completely disregard, for example, the vertical component of the velocity, or the temperature, or the pressure, and you look at what is the quantity that is of interest for you directly, which is the wind direction and wind speed in the horizontal plane. And my question is very specific. Would you expect to have better results if looking at your missing field also when looking your when creating your catalog of uh, analogs okay um so um in general uh for uh, so to uh, maybe i will answer first uh, the, the the second part of your question which is uh if we have uh if we add uh information on the the vertical uh, uh, distribution of velocity uh, would that uh, make the forecast uh, more efficient if we uh, for instance uh, still want to forecast the uh, horizontal uh, velocity uh, close to the the sea surface uh, in this case uh, the it, it, it is actually a maybe very general uh, question for uh, uh, data-based uh, forecasts, and uh, I cannot answer uh, uh, in general to this question. If you if you um, uh, use a special uh, data-based forecast scheme, and uh, sometimes adding information on the state of the system for a particular application, such as, as forecasting can make the the the, the forecast uh, better or worse uh, depending on it really depends on how uh, the information that you add uh, is important for uh, uh, the task that you want to perform such as a forecast uh, uh, or, or another task it also uh, it is uh, uh, I think what we are talking about here is reminiscent of uh, a, a, a comment and a question that you you had uh, in the, the report about the, the wave data. Uh, you were asking if we also have information on the uh, uh, horizontal deplacements of the buoy. And uh, so, yes, we do. We, we had uh, this information, but we chose uh, for this uh, first experiment not to use it. And uh, so uh, the first thing that I can say is that if we add this information, to find good analogs, for instance, you, we would need to have uh, more data. So for instance, uh, in this uh, uh, wave uh, elevation example, uh, we were using just 30 minutes of data, so a very small catalog. And if we were to include uh, other dimensions, uh, as we saw uh, in, the, in, the, in the first part of this presentation, if the dimension uh, increases, uh, you have to have more data to to find a good analog. So it's a, a, a first uh, beginning of answer. Uh, now uh, about um, uh, the the dimension of uh, uh, the data and the system, and this question of a finite or an infinite dimension. Um, so the fact that we have, uh, uh, for instance, uh, imagine that we're looking just at temperature uh, and we are looking at temperature, uh, a three-dimensional field of temperature. Uh, so we could say that there are uh, uh, maybe four dimensions uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, so three dimensions in physical space, uh, three, three physical space coordinates uh, and uh, uh, a dimension uh, uh, of time, and but but then uh, uh, the dimension that I am talking about uh, in the uh, uh, in in all my my PhD and uh, manuscript and uh, 
uh, especially in this uh, analog to target uh, 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 description, uh, the dimension here would be uh, the number of points that you need in space to accurately represent uh, the field. So you may have uh, three dimensions of uh, physical space, but if you want to know the temperature over uh, a 20 kilometer uh, grid uh, with, uh, I don't know, two kilometers uh, in, uh, in altitude, then uh, you would need much more points. You would need maybe uh, 3,000 points. So then the dimension would be uh, 3,000. And the question is, uh, uh, how many points do you need in this dice discretized grid to have an uh, uh, accurate enough representation of, uh, of the, the real uh, temperature field. So uh, in theory, to have the best representation, you would need an infinite number of points. But uh, in practice, uh, finite dimensional approximations can be sufficient. Of course. OK, yet afterwards, um, the, the Okay, I will not re-ask this question because it's too closely related, but th this confusion for me was a bit entertained afterwards when you try to approximate the Jacobian of the flow in the next chapter for the same reason, in fact. Uh, let's say it's a, a bit of lack of comprehension from my side, but there is something that is not fully clear to me about this, uh, this co correspondence, but Anyway, yet I'm satisfied by your answer. And if I have a few minutes left, uh, I, I would also yes, like yes. to go a little bit on the topic of um, of water waves, which was your chapter four, I guess. Um, Okay, first of all, this, this chapter is a bit different from the others because you, you rely on deterministic model and uh, on trying to predict behavior from data based on a deterministic model, which is also very interesting. Um, and I had several questions that I tried to put in the report. Uh, one of them probably trying to, to stay brief which was thrilling to me is uh, when you looked at um, the choice of the neighboring points you do to try to, to predict the, the dimensions, well, the parameters of your wave group. Um, this also is closely related to your application because uh, if you go to uh, incident uh, radar data, you will not see the truth of the waves. On the other hand, if you look from the top, you will have different information. And you briefly discussed that in your manuscript, but it was a bit, um, I, I mean, I had the feeling that you had more things to say about it. So <laughs> could you please uh, provide some det details about it? Okay, so um, so th this remark is really uh, on point. And uh, uh, first, I must say that we we did not uh, perform a uh, a uh, 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 systematic study of uh, the influence of how many crests and trough uh, are used. Um, so the uh, I can also only say uh, very general things. Uh, so in our forecast uh, scheme, we rely on uh, uh, spatial variations of uh, the crest velocity in the, in the wave propagation direction. So to have an estimation of this, this gradient of uh, crest velocity, we need at least two points. So it is the, the really most uh, minimum number of points that we need. Um, so we would need at least maybe uh, two crest velocities or uh, the velocities of one crest and one trough. Um, okay, so that's the minimum that uh, we need. Then um, for several reasons, uh, it might be interesting to have more points. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, another thing that we did not uh, study precisely in the in the study is what happens when there is observational noise. 
we did not include that. And so when you have observational noise, having uh, more than one uh, point to make an estimation uh, would be, of course, uh, better for statistical robustness. Uh, uh, so to have uh, to increase this statistical robustness, we can either use more crests and troughs uh, at the same time, or we can also use uh, averaging uh, in time. That would be uh, an option to to make it uh, 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 this uh, to make this estimation uh, more stable. Uh, uh, also, well, and this uh, will, uh, th but there's a, there's a. If we try to use uh, uh, more than uh, two crests and troughs uh, at one time, then uh, uh, what might come into play is that uh, in real applications, uh, there might be uh, at the at the limit of the wave packet, there might be influence from other wave packets. So uh, our our forecast method might not work in this case. So that's why we try to use as few points as possible. We found that uh, three uh, seemed to be a, a good uh, a good choice. It did work in practice, but um, it would have been interesting to, to try to see what happens when we use more. Um, and also, yeah, th th this uh, uh, will also depend on how uh, uh, much uh, nonlinear effect we have because uh, uh, as we have seen in experiments, uh, uh, when the wave packet is highly nonlinear, uh, when the amplitude is uh, too large, uh, and especially the steepness is too large, uh, then uh, we have this, so this, this simple profile of uh, crest velocity becomes much more complicated. And uh, uh, having this estimation of uh, crest gradient might not uh, be very reliable. So uh, we might want to use uh, less uh, points uh, in this case. So yeah, so my answer is, is very general and I think we should perform uh, uh, tests to, to see what really happens uh, in practice. Yeah, yeah, to change your method during the analysis. So you already had a small background on that. But anyway, and I, I will just finish with a more philosophical question on this uh, chapter. Uh, so you the purpose is to have prediction of uh, of extreme wave on a deterministic uh, determined uh, site um, provided that you have spatial distribution and information about incoming water waves say uh, in the next uh, 20 or 30 seconds uh, and your full method is based on um, dispersive focusing of water wave assuming that you have the complete description of your field based on uh, Gaussian wave packets. Uh, so you are, of course, disregarding some mechanism through this. But on the other hand, you might have um, a complete representation of uh, the elevation field based on this approach. So in your opinion, is it enough to predict every uh, danger, potential dangerous wave, or do you have the feeling that you are excluding some of these events uh, in advance? Excluding some of the of the what? Sorry, I didn't get the of the event potentially dangerous events you might uh, see. Uh, yes, I, I think we are omitting uh, some events. Uh, uh, well, first, uh, this method uh, relies on uh, the assumption of unidirectional wave fields. So, so yes, uh, uh, I'm not sure if I am answering uh, correctly your 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 question. Uh, first, uh, we have made many hypotheses. The fact that the the there is uh, no interaction between wave packets. And although that uh, usually happens on um, uh, large uh, time scale, uh, I think it, it, it can still uh, happen by chance that uh, such uh, a mechanism is ongoing in that in uh, 30 seconds, it does make uh, a difference that we uh, chose 
to assume that they're independent, uh, wave packets are independent. Uh, also, directional effects might, might come into play. Uh, uh, the influence of wind can have uh, lots of uh, consequences, especially on uh, on large waves, even for uh, for um, for for small uh, time scales. So, uh, for all the, these reasons, we do uh, uh, we would miss uh, some some special uh, uh, events. But uh, yes, I, I'm not sure if I did answer uh, exactly what you were asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, the, um, the spirit, but uh, it, it would be nice to conclude with uh, so some kind of uh, hope of success with this approach. I mean, do you feel you would? miss 80 percent of the events or five percent of the events um it's it's a it's a very good question how yeah we would probably miss a, a small fraction of the events um however i think uh if, if this uh, forecast scheme is really to be used for uh, safety purposes, it should be improved, definitely, because some of the events that we miss might be the strongest ones. Uh, because for, since we have this hypothesis of uh, a small wave steepness, for instance, uh, so we might uh, uh, be able to, to forecast uh, uh, most uh, extreme waves, but some of the waves that we would miss would be the largest ones. So uh, maybe uh, as it is, this forecast scheme would be uh, usable uh, and it would, uh, I hope, uh, catch most of the extreme waves in uh, s uh, small uh, average steep steepness uh, conditions in uh, sea states that are not too rough, for instance, uh, if uh, maintenance is performed uh, and uh, the the uh, the the sea state is intermediate, so there might be some uh, large waves, uh, but uh, so uh, in, in but maybe not uh, waves that are so large that they would uh, break a boat, for instance. And I think in this case uh, uh, we would be able to 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 catch most of the the incoming largest waves. Thank you very much. I think I will have to leave the voice, the, some room to the other voices. Thank you very much for your answers. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, very much. Julia. So now it's, uh, I will give the floor to uh, Dimitris Giannakis from New York. Dimitris, you can uh, give your comments and ask your questions. Okay. Uh, so first of all, um, I'd like to congratulate Paul for a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, like Juliana, I also enjoyed um, very much reading reading the thesis. I thought it was uh, very cle clearly written. Uh, it, it did. Um, there was a nice sort of literature service survey in the introduction, and and then the results I think uh, are significant uh, both in terms of. Uh, you know, breadth, uh, obviously, uh, and um, and depth. So I think it was, um, um, I, I enjoyed reading uh, the thesis and I also learned some things as well. Uh, so if, if, if I if I had to make, a, say, one comment is that, uh, so there's a lot of emphasis, obviously, on um, uh, uh, various estimates of the performance of analog forecasting using Ideas from sort of state-based uh, state-based theory for, for for dynamical systems. Though I do wonder whether, to some extent, uh, whether these notions are the most appropriate in the context of geophysical uh, systems forecasting, and also maybe they they might lead to, to overly pessimistic estimates in some cases, meaning. And, and let me elaborate. I guess one one aspect here is that um, uh, in, in in practical applications, we're almost always dealing with um, sort of projected or you know, partially observed systems. We, we never have access to every 
uh, every degree of freedom. So um, um, I wonder, you know, to what extent, uh, you know, sort of thinking in terms of Jacobians and this type of objects, whether um, is the, the the truly relevant notion in when you're dealing with highly non-Markovian time series, as, as would be the case uh, in most practical um, applications of of analog forecasting. Uh, but but you know I I do want to make clear that I think what 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 you did is definitely valuable because it does give insight um, on on the behavior of the methods when when you do have access to the to the whole state space or or at least a sufficiently large portion of the state space such that the data is um, Markovian um, and and the other aspect is that uh, um, which is sort of a trend uh, these days there's there's a lot of interest um, sort of from the machine learning community on uh, interpolation and function approximation in high dimensional uh, high dimensional spaces um, of da you know data spaces uh, in particular where sort of one of the key the key aspects that uh, appears in the various estimates is the notion of regularity of observables namely uh, in, in many cases, the skills of the algorithm depends quite crucially on um, not only, let's say, the properties of the dynamics, like let's say Lyapunov exponents and so on, which obviously are important, but also on what observable of the dynamics you, one is trying to uh, to forecast. Um, and uh, if the observable happens to have high regularity, for example, you might need a considerably lower number of samples to 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 create um, um, a data driven function uh, approximating it as in the case of uh, i guess uh, analog forecasting uh, so i guess th th these were my two comments uh, but you you did mention also uh, in your future future work slide some aspects related to that and also in the thesis so i think um, this is not really a criticism it's just more of a uh, more of a comment. Uh, so maybe uh, I can start by asking sort of sequentially some questions. So in the beginning of the of the of the presentation, you mentioned um, you know one of the benefits of analog methods is that they they avoid the some of the computational cost uh, associated with first principles models and. Uh, um, and in particular, that there are methods from machine learning that allow you to very sort of quickly um, access um, your your to sort of find uh, states in your catalog. Uh, so I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on 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 these methods because if I were let's say to play devil's advocate here, I would say compare if you want to compare apples to apples, you would compare an analog. Oops, it will lose. Paul, I think we may have, I, I don't see Paul anymore on my screen, so I'm not sure if he, he can hear us. I can, are you? I can. Uh, you, you can see Paul? No. <laughs> no. It looks like we lost uh, Paul. Hmm. Yes. So we 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 are changing something. Okay. So Paul, you can talk. Okay. I change the screen. Can you? Oh yes. I will start the, the video so that you can see me. I am using uh, now Pierre uh, Tandeau's. Uh, Computer. Okay. Can, can you see me now? Or maybe not? We can hear you, but not see you. You cannot see me. Okay. I will. Uh, okay. This might be a, a, a network issue. I will, uh, Okay. 
Okay, you. you can see me and hear me? Okay, can, Paul will come here. You can just maybe answer on... Okay. The image will come later. <laughs> okay, uh, so yes, please uh, uh, continue. You were saying that uh, to compare apples with apple, yeah. uh, you would have to compare analogs with... Yeah, so I, I was saying that, you know, if if one was to place devil's advocate here, they would say, I will, uh, let's compare analog forecasting with, an, with a parametric model, like a regression model or some other statistical uh -huh. model that, let's say, has a handful of parameters, uh, whereas, or like even dozens of parameters, whereas uh, in the case of analog, you, you have to carry with you this massive catalog, which especially when dealing with high dimensional, sort of spatial temporal systems, that could be like, you know, gigabytes of data. So if we want to do like forecasting in the in the in you know, real time, like winds and wind turbines and and the like. Uh, so I was wondering if you could comment on what what methods you have in mind that allow you to 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 over potentially overcome this or have efficient um, representation of uh, data in that case. Um, okay. So if I understand well. Uh... The question is about uh, which method should be used uh, to 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 find the best representation of data to perform analog forecast. No, I was thinking like you know in the beginning of the presentation you mentioned that there are uh, you know techniques that allow you to you know uh, rapidly uh, you know access your catalog or something uh, along those lines. I was wondering which techniques you had in mind in, in particular. Oh. Um, uh, the techniques in particular, uh, so there are the, uh, oh, okay, I have forgot, forgotten the name, but there are uh, uh, algorithms, uh, uh, libraries in Python to, to search for analogs which are uh, efficient, so uh, uh, the trees, uh, KD trees, uh, and uh, yes. So I, I have I haven't uh, focused uh, really on the aspects of how fast uh, uh, it is, uh, but but yes, I was I was thinking of of these uh, uh, quad tree uh, methods. Yes, so I could not give you uh, uh, by heart the efficient the efficiency of these methods, but I was I was thinking of this. Okay. This is what we were using. Yeah, I mean, yeah. One issue with those methods is that you know when the data they work well when the dimension of the data space is low, but then they mm -hmm. sort of become exponentially inefficient when the data or you know they, they when the dimension of the data increases. The three three based um, approaches, I guess, could become somewhat inefficient. But but there, maybe there are other methods like randomized uh, projection methods or some other ways of um, sort of summarizing the data uh, in higher dimensions. Uh, so another related, not quite, but somewhat related question is that if we're interested in, let's say, doing prediction of uh, wind for, um, or, or for that matter, many other sort of geophysical uh, variables, so, do you have any guidance as to how how we're going to choose the way that we select those analogs? How do we measure, you know, the, the, the relevant uh, features of the data that will, will lead us to 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 identify good analogs? Uh, and to give a concrete example, um, so if if the you know. Uh, the weather in Earth is coming to us from the west to the east. If I want to make a forecast about some, you know, um, uh, meteorological variable at a given location, maybe I shouldn't be looking at, um, you know, uh, snapshots of uh, weather uh, variables uh, in the location where I am now, but maybe I should be looking sort of upstream somewhere, like towards maybe to the west of me, because this is where, 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 where the weather is coming from, for example. Um, did, have you explored any 
any uh, aspects related to that, how you choose your uh, the way that you basically um, uh, you know compare uh, or identify uh, the, the the best analog state in the in the catalog, taking into account some of this you know spatial or spatial temporal information. Okay, so. Um... Uh, I have not explored it uh, directly myself, uh, but um, so yes, how should we select analogs? Uh, the, f the first thing that I could say is that uh, relying on Euclidean like distances has the advantage that uh, it is the most uh, used uh, mathematical distance probably. And so uh, most of the libraries to that allow to perform an efficient uh, search for analogs uh, would be uh, usable uh, when using uh, uh, Euclidean-like distances. Now, uh, uh, in the example that you mentioned, uh, if uh, there is some, um, uh, some, let's say, propagation of energy or of uh, information uh, in a certain uh, direction. And if uh, you want maybe to, to, to forecast the future and most of the information is coming from uh, the west of the map, for instance, uh, one possible way would be to, to, to uh, adjust uh, by hand coefficients uh, on a, a on a Euclidean-like uh, distance, but just having weights for uh, different parts of the, the physical uh, space. Uh, another way would be to, uh, uh, so it would be uh, maybe a, a semi-parametric uh, method. It would be to uh, optimize these weights uh, based on a given uh, criterion. Uh, and uh, this was done in, in a study uh, which uh, I, I cite in the, in the introduction, uh, but I have not uh, uh, used it uh, myself. So these are uh, uh, options that I see uh, right now when you ask me the, the, this question. Which study was that? I'm sort of curious. Which study? Uh, it was, um, so I don't have it in my slides. Um, oh. It was after 2010, uh, I think, and it was, uh, 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 adapt, adapt, uh, I don't remember either the authors nor the, nor the name, but it was, uh, uh, yes, uh, adapting, uh, uh, distance for, uh, analog, uh, search or something uh, like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I could yeah. send it uh, to you. Okay. So now the, the, um, other thing I wanted to ask about, uh, was this about this uh, uh, local uh, local lead, uh, so not, not not sorry I'm trying to recall the right the, the terminology so you had these uh, three versions of the various forecast uh, operators that was the locally con constant uh, locally incremental and then the third one I forget now the uh, locally linear was it yes locally linear right. Yes. Yeah. And and so um, so for that there was a picture that you had this schematic um, that you were showing the, the very trajectory that showed a very accurate uh, reconstruction of the trajectory. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more exactly how this uh, uh, local uh, regression model works. I didn't quite get that part. Uh, so uh, yes, the uh, uh, I have troubles uh, getting to my slides, but it's not uh, it's not important. Uh, yes, the the idealized uh, example uh, that I showed uh, gave better performances for the the locally linear, uh, and the the reason was simple. It was that uh, the model for the temporal evolution that was chosen for uh, this uh, example was uh, almost linear. So, of course, making a linear regression between analogs and successors uh, would give uh, a very uh, accurate estimation of, of, of the future state. Um, uh, now, there are many situations 
where uh, it, it might not work. Um, uh, yes, it's a, it's a shame that I cannot uh, access my my slides. Uh, or maybe yeah, we should have screen. Uh, yes, mais peut-être que tu les as pas ici. Okay. Okay. So Pia is <laughs> showing the slides. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, now I have to remember uh, what I wanted to show. Uh, yes, maybe you can show again a slide. Uh, I guess. 19 or no, even before uh, with the yes this one uh, 18 slide 18 slide yes, yes. Uh, with the uh, 18 with, yes yeah. this is 17 sorry <laughs> okay okay so here uh, we can see for instance uh, so so this is data from the Lawrence uh, system so it's a, a low dimensional uh, system so uh, yes it, so Already, uh, problems with uh, high dimension are avoided, and uh, but even in this case, um, we can see, for instance, that the the D curve, which corresponds to the locally linear uh, in the in the weak noise case, the the green dashed curve, uh, does uh, come back to the same performances as the uh, locally incremental, locally constant uh, in uh, high dimension, and. Uh, is that what? No. Uh, and okay, uh, uh, but uh, what what I'm showing here is a median error. Okay, and this is uh, so th th the fact that the methods have the same performances uh, for a large time horizon was already uh, mentioned by Farmer and Sdorovich. Um, but here I am showing median errors, and uh, uh, an important point is that uh, actually performing this uh, this uh, linear regression with S uh, can give better performances, but it also uh, increases the variability because if you do not look at median errors, but if you look at average errors, then uh, there are some uh, uh, specific events where the forecast uh, is so bad that it does change. Uh, the the 10th worst forecast are are so bad that it does change a lot the 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 behavior of the the mean error uh, in, in in the paper of farmer and sidorovich they removed the 10 percent worst worst forecast and they look at uh, mean errors so that they could find this slope with the the Lyapunov exponent so maybe one comment that I, I could do but maybe it's not exactly what you were asking but one comment that I can do is that doing this regression, uh, adds variability uh, actually to the process, and uh, uh, also uh, it does demand uh, to have more analogs because you have to perform to you have to invert the matrix. Uh, uh, so depending on the dimension, it might uh, rely on much more analogs. And uh, uh, yes, so is the matrix S dependent also on the? Sort of uh, initial conditioners, or is it like a global uh, regression uh, matrix that will fit? I, I didn't quite. No, so you see, it, it is a, a local uh, regression. Uh, so it is a regression that is performed only on the set of analogs that you use. So I'm assuming here that uh, uh, you use maybe 40 analogs. And also, uh, uh, what is done in the paper by uh, Elgensat et al., and what we did also, uh, is that. Uh, there are weights uh, given to the the analogs. It's uh, maybe uh, uh, Pierre, if you come back uh, uh, two slides or just one slide, yeah, just one. Uh, the the triangles here have uh, uh, sizes which are proportional to the the weights that we use, and these weights are uh, um, depend exponentially uh, on the the dis the analog to target distance. Um, so. Uh, it kind it, it does reject uh, their uh, kernel weights. They do reject uh, some of uh, the analogs. But uh, yes, it is. Yeah, I could uh, talk more about uh, these weights and how they are set. But uh, so yes, it is a local regression. Hmm. And so, in the case of the local incremental, I mean that, that sounds like a natural way of you know, as you mentioned, of getting the the forecast error to be sort of. Um, 
uh, basically zero by construction that uh, when you when you start uh, the when you initialize it. Uh, but then you, you you made a point that at later times the distribution can uh, or the, the trajectory at later times can can exhibit worse performance than the locally constant uh, method. Uh, so is that reflected by this little blip that there was in the curve, I guess, in the next slide? Uh, uh, in, in the, and, and if so, could you, could you, um, is there an intuition as to why the local incremental f uh, forecast at some point might do worse, at least even for, on a transient interval than the locally constant? Mm. Uh, so, uh, my intuition on that uh, is simply that the 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 Jacobian matrix. So we it's still in the context of uh, of uh, deterministic dynamics and so on. Uh, for intermediate times, the Jacobian matrix uh, uh, is not the identity, uh, and uh, adding this uh, this. Uh, uh, so, adding this uh, I uh, correction uh, assumes that the, this Jacobian matrix is the identity. And maybe if you switch the uh, Pierre, if you go to the next slide, uh, yes, uh, with the figure. Uh, so this this would uh, uh, it's it's like um, uh, my my intuition is that it is like making a random guess, which is uh, simply wrong. So for for intermediate times, uh, it is it is not uh, efficient to add this uh, this uh, this term with uh, s uh, uh, equals i. For large times, of course, uh, it does not change. So uh, yes, I hope I answered your question here. Yes. Okay. And um, so I guess one, maybe one final question is. Uh, so, in a lot of the systems, including you know Lorenz uh, sixty three that uh, um, you showed in the example, the the uh, interval of predictability of useful predictability could depend uh, quite significantly on what is the initial state on on the uh, uh, attractor, namely. Um, if I recall correctly from one of the probably earlier slides, uh, in, in the card, in the example you were showing that the star as the as the um, initial condition, which seemed to be in the sort of in the um, intersection region between the two uh, lobes of the uh, of the Lorentz attractor, where where this is where basically mixing happens, and you have uh, probably limited predictability as, as compared to, let's say, when you are um, safely, you know, so to speak, within one of the lobes or, you know, close to the, you know, to the fixed point. Uh, it, have you studied to what extent uh, the performance of these methods might depend uh, on where, you know, the star is, so to speak, uh, on the attractor? Yes, uh, thank you for, for this question. Uh, uh, so it does depend uh, on, on where you start. Uh, here, the the example that I picked. Yeah, uh, uh, truc. So here, uh, it does not change uh, much for for what for my the purpose of uh, of the first part because the first part is only about analog to target distances. So the fact the the fact that you find analogs that are close uh, does not mean that. Uh, uh, you will be able to make a forecast, for instance. Uh, but uh, so, for for the purpose of distances, uh, the fact that it is in uh, the target is in the begin in the in the middle of the two uh, uh, lobes uh, is uh, did not make a, a big difference. Um, what we saw uh, when uh, I, so I was making uh, uh, plots, for instance, on this uh, Lorentz sixty three system of. Uh, um, of uh, forecast error uh, using analogs. Uh, surprisingly, I did not see uh, uh, much variation when uh, looking at the uh, so the place where the black star is uh, right now. 
but uh, I saw um, uh, problems with analog forecasts when uh, uh, we are in the tail of uh, the, the wings of the butterfly uh, in uh, places where uh, the, the density uh, uh, of points is actually uh, a smaller. Um, so, uh, but we, um, yeah, the fact that we, we saw the problem only on the, in the tail of the wings and not in the in the uh, uh, in the middle of uh, the attractor uh, is maybe the fact that uh, we were looking at uh, uh, high uh, 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 catalogs with a lot of points, and I, I guess that uh, if we had uh, smaller uh, catalogs, there might be a problem also uh, in the middle because you would have analogs coming from uh, different directions, and this would uh, uh, make the predictability uh, uh, worse. Okay, so and so to 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 to, end, to finally uh, uh, end my answer to your question, uh, what we can see is that the fact that we can find less uh, analogs uh, at some points in the tail of the the the, the butterfly uh, is uh, close to uh, what we started to investigate in the in the last chapter of the PhD with the uh, analogs of extremes and uh, maybe Pi if you can go. Uh, uh, so very far away because you will have to go to my <laughs> uh, next slides. So maybe uh, switch to the conclusion. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, go to the conclusion and then go to the right. Uh, go to the right a lot. To the right. Yeah, the direction. After yes, after conclusion, there are backup slides. Just go to the right. No. Yeah. Uh, You can okay, so maybe uh, t type the number, uh, uh, the choose the number a uh, hundred. Okay, there you are, and uh, then you can go to analogs of extremes. Uh, yeah, uh, no, before maybe just the beginning, uh, even before. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, what we saw uh, was that uh, so if you if you think of uh, uh, heavy tail random variables, uh, uh, well th there are different uh, possible behavior in a tail of a probability distribution, and uh, heavy tail random variables uh, are such that the the density uh, in the tail, even if you look at a reasonable quantile, for instance, uh, you're looking at the tail of the distribution and you want to have uh, analogs. Uh, up to a, a, a state which belongs to the 99% quantile. Uh, for heavy tail var random variables, the density here is much uh, uh, lower. And uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, the theory that we had uh, uh, previously was that the, the density is proportional to, to r to the r to the power d, but uh, actually if you are in a, in a place where the density is smaller, uh, this first order approximation is not uh, true anymore. And uh, for instance, everything that we have said with uh, RK uh, that is proportional to K to the power D is not exactly true. Uh, and so we can have a kind of uh, overestimation of the dimension in the tail of uh, probability distributions. So yes, yeah, so okay, maybe I was, uh, <laughs> going uh, far from your initial question, but uh, yes, there are uh, differences depending on where you start, depending on the density of the point, the density of points, uh, and depending also on the, the, the dynamics uh, at this point. So you believe that um, uh, in your sort of like a, a maybe final philosophical question, uh, you believe that analogs uh, could potentially uh, so if you're just in forecasting extremes, are there a viable strategy given that you have to, you know, assemble this, you know, catalog and, you know, you have to have some samples of, uh, you know, these extremes in order to predict them. Do, do, do you, do you, um, can, can, do you, do you think this is a feasible strategy um, to go forward? To use, uh, to use analogs for extremes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I think uh, it has not been studied uh, uh, thoroughly enough 
to, to, to my knowledge, uh, to, to be sure that it would work. Uh, uh, usually what happens is that in the tail of a, a, a distribution, especially a heavy tailed, uh, for heavy tailed variables, uh, the, the tail has to be parameterized. And uh, what is done with analog forecasting is that usually you want to avoid to, par to, to parameterize uh, anything. So uh, uh, what, um, what we can see uh, here is that, yes, uh, from this slide, for instance, uh, since the density is low, uh, the, the number, you would need a much larger sample uh, number of samples to, to find analogs of extremes. So um, uh, I think it, it, it does depend on, on, on the application, but uh, what uh, uh, people have seen, uh, for instance, there is a study by uh, Tayada et al, I think of 2017 or 16, and uh, when using different uh, uh, database methods to forecast the rain, for instance, which has a a uh, heavy tail uh, in uh, in many places. Uh, they found that the the analog forecast was the the the, the worst uh, uh, forecast technique that they used, database forecast technique. But uh, there are some ways uh, to uh, sample more efficiently uh, in the tail. So maybe that's maybe that's the lead that should be taken to make analog forecast of extreme events would be to to not to parameterize because it would not really be analog mm -hmm. forecasting anymore, but to uh, uh, use uh, techniques from um, important uh, sampling, for instance, to have more samples in the tail. Okay, thank you. The, the, these were my questions. Thanks again for um, a very nice presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. No, uh... Give the microphone to uh, Anne Catherine Favre from Grenoble. Thank you very much, Valerie. So, first of all, I have to congratulate you, Paul, because you did a very clear and pedagogical presentation. In my life, I also work with analogs, but uh, I would say more from a practical point of view. So, we had the question and you try to answer it from a, I will say, a theoretical point of view. So it, I think it is to be noted that it's very important also for the community of practical application for forecasters, I will say. So it, it, is, it is good. Um, I, my first question is, uh, when you apply, you told, you told us that when you applied uh, analog methods, you use tools from intelligent artificial intelligence and uh, uh, more precisely about mach machine learning to find your analogs. Yes, is it true? And can you tell me a bit more about it? Uh, yes. So uh, th thank you for uh, for your comments. Um, um, uh, I think it is related to the question of uh, Mr. Janikis before. So the, there are those uh, uh, three techniques um, that allow to, to search efficiently for, for analogs. So, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, in practice, uh, I only used uh, the, the technique that was available. I used this technique and uh, I did not work especially on um, uh, how it works and what are the, the performances, but it did uh, make the search faster than a simple search. Good. Because also yeah. because we were looking at uh, at low dimensional uh, uh, systems. Yes, I understand. So uh, I have another question. If I understand correctly, uh, you have only used the Euclidean distance, yes? And, and it is an important question when you, you, you rely on analogs. Uh, so, all your uh, theoretical in, in fact results, do they rely on the choice or not? Are they independent on the distant choice or not? So, uh, the results that are shown are mostly uh, results in the limit of a large catalog, and so in the limit of, uh, uh, to be more precise, of a dense catalog. And uh, you could say that uh, in the final limit, in the, the mathematical limit, uh, uh, 
in finite dimension, uh, all distances are equivalent, so the the results would still hold. Uh, but uh, then it depends uh, on practice, uh, uh, on the application. Um, for instance, uh, maybe Pierre, if you go back to uh, um, uh, yes, uh, you can go to slide number. Uh, 18 or 17. Whoa, emphasize. <laughs> this slide 17. Yes, okay. Uh, it's surprising. Okay, go to the uh, the end of analog forecasting, please. The uh, yes, and just before. Uh, okay, so here, for instance, uh, the result is that um, if you take this this expression, uh, huh? and uh, so there is a noise term, so this noise term will be there uh, no matter which analog you choose, but the other term depends on the difference between the analog and the target. Yes. And so, if the if the distance uh, between the analog and the target goes to zero, this term goes to zero. Now, the question is how fast does it go to zero? And uh, this will depend on 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 the, on the case, on the application. And, and in this, so the, 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 the speed of, of how it goes to zero depends on the distance you choose. Uh, and uh, 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 for, for instance, there are many uh, other types of distance that can be used. Uh, maybe the, for instance, the Wasserstein distance, which uh, uh, has the advantage compared to the Euclidean distance of uh, 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 well uh, taking into account uh, translations, uh, um, and uh, so it can be more physical in some in some situations. Uh, but the advantage of the Euclidean distance is that. Uh, uh, it is very fast, uh, and because everyone uh, uses it. So when when it is relevant, uh, I think it's a, a good option to use it. But but so yes, uh, our results uh, do depend in some sense on on, on which uh, distance uh, is used. Yes, thank you. Uh, about operators, it's the same kind of question of as Dimitris, I think. You have used three different operators, UL, what is called LC, LI, and LL. Uh, have you uh, tried other operators, or do you think other types of operator could be relevant for, uh, you know, forecasts? Uh, yes. Uh, so I, I have not used uh, other uh, uh, operators, uh, yeah. but uh, maybe, uh, Pierre, if you go just a little bit forward to have yes um uh for instance uh, uh there is this locally linear uh um so this operator performs a linear regression uh but it it simply performs uh so, so the you, you can perform linear regression uh but uh it depends on uh in which space this uh, regression uh, is performed and uh, that is a, an issue which I did not tackle the, during this presentation, and uh, only uh, little uh, uh, have I started to tackle it in, in my work. Um, uh, for instance, if the, the dimension is high uh, of your system and you want to make a linear regression, but you don't have much analogs, uh, you might want to use dimension reduction techniques such as EOF, for instance. Uh, and and to perform this regression in in a reduced uh, space, and so that's already uh, a, a it gives so there are many uh, possibilities uh, already uh, starting from there uh, uh, for uh, in which space do you make a linear regression? Uh, you could uh, use a kernel uh, uh, Hilbert spaces uh, as uh, for instance. Uh, uh, Mr. Ivanakis is uh, doing uh, with colleagues, and that would completely change the the result. Um, then uh, one could also try uh, other things. Uh, the so the locally incremental, as we've seen, uh, for very short time, uh, it, it does give uh, better results. Uh, and you could think, okay, maybe uh, I could also have another uh, 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 cons. Uh, 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 let's say. Uh, 
I could specify S uh, directly with uh, maybe something that depends on time, uh, for instance. That's something that uh, I've started to, to think about, but it is not so easy because uh, uh, to, 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 to give, uh, to specify S and for it to be uh, um, uh, efficient on a large number of situations, uh, actually, it is it is hard to find a, a good uh, particular uh, method. And uh, when talking with, uh, because I have uh, looked mostly at theoretical aspects, and when I am talking with people who use analogs in practice, uh, colleagues, uh, sometimes they say that uh, in the end, the 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 uh, the most uh, uh, the the method that worked the best for uh, for them was the locally constant, which was the the simplest. So yes. So I'm very interested by heavy tail distribution and you know the, the the perspective in analogs for extreme value distribution and heavy tail distribution. Do you think it could be interesting or to mix analog method with with more, you know, I think I will say classical methods that mean using a distribution? Because of course when we want to use analog, we don't uh, make uh, any uh, as assumption of distribution, but we do you think it is worth to try mixing both methods? Yes, uh, yes. definitely. Uh, I really think it, it would be uh, interesting because so uh, what I have focused on uh, is uh, I tried to uh, uh, quantify uh, how how long the catalog must be when looking at. Uh, uh, very heavy tailed uh, variables because i think i think it's important to do that uh, uh, because the the work has been done i think for uh, high dimensional systems it's now very clear that uh, in very high dimension the density of points is low so you need to have more analogs so now uh, i think the to answer the question of the density of points in the tail of heavy tailed uh, random variables i think all the theoretical tools are already uh, out there. I think it's uh, it's only a matter of uh, putting uh, elements together to say, okay, uh, if I apply analog forecasting blindly and I'm looking at heavy-tailed uh, uh, random variables, uh, then the, the theory uh, tells me that if uh, Xi is uh, uh, equal to uh, 0.2, the, the tail mm -hmm. parameter, uh, then uh, the, I would need to increase my catalog size by uh, this much. Okay, and uh, then uh, I think that uh, yes, in in practice, um, uh, if if you want to make analogs more efficient uh, in the tail of the distribution, uh, one way would say okay, we have to change the sampling. Uh, and the other way would be uh, uh, yes, we could use parameterization of the tail uh, to 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 mix this uh, non-parametric and parametric method. And I think uh, intuitively that maybe the second option is the best because the first option is interesting, but it is uh, very limited because usually uh, with analogs uh, you have a limited catalog. You have mm -hmm. maybe twenty years of data. And you have a limited number of extremes uh, in that one, so uh, you can give more weight maybe to uh, analogs which uh, are uh, analogs of extremes, uh, uh, but you cannot uh, uh, you cannot uh, create you cannot resample usually in practice when using analogs. So I think uh, maybe the, the for heavy-tailed distributions uh, using param parametric uh, method in combination with analogs is the best way. Because, uh, and to conclude, for uh, uh, light-tailed distributions, I think uh, uh, I have uh, saw, for instance, uh, works of uh, 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 Pascal Yu, uh, and uh, to, to uh, use important sampling in order to, uh, uh, for instance, give uh, a list of possible hot summers if you think of temperature, for instance, which is light-tailed, it seems to work uh, with the with the number of data that we have today. But maybe for heavy-tailed, uh, for instance, for rain, I think uh, yes, their uh, parameterization uh, would be necessary. Thank you very much. I've got the final question, more general one. 
uh, you have shown us very interesting perspectives. Yes. yes. According yes. to you, if you have six months now more to develop your research, what would be the most interesting perspective, according to you, of course? Yeah. Uh, if you have just six months. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Oh, if if you need nine, uh, I will give you nine. <laughs> I guess, well, uh, personally, I think I would uh, really uh, like to 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 finish what we have started on uh, this uh, uh, extreme uh, analogs of extremes. I think uh, uh, yes, uh, I think it's it's really an important thing to do because it's really the the counterpart of this uh, uh, problem of. Uh, a few analogs in high dimension, and I think the, there are interesting uh, comparisons, uh, as I was uh, starting to say, uh, in uh, in the tail of distributions, when you uh, try to estimate uh, the dimension using analogs, you have, uh, uh, you can overestimate the dimension, so there's really a parallel, and I think it should be, uh, it should be uh, digged uh, more, and it should be feasible in, in six months, so I think it is the, the way I would go uh, if I had just uh, six months. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now uh, Bertrand Chaperon is uh, invited in the committee. I guess he, he would like to give some comments and maybe also ask a one or two short questions. So we are thinking of where Bertrand can come. Okay. Hello. Um, so first, uh, as a general comment on, about the uh, first the document that uh, I received and read with uh, great pleasure. So congratulations on the quality for the uh, writing, and Thank obviously, you. I guess uh, everybody will agree on the uh, quality of your uh, oral expression and uh, the clarity of your. Uh, of your demonstration. Thank so you. now I have, uh, I don't know if I have questions or, or, or comments. Uh, I, I would like to, to go back in, a, in a, not go back, but um, this idea of uh, building analogs immediately uh, uh, called for me to, uh, to the fact that we don't you seem to, uh, to, uh, to look for uh, a first uh, projection of your data, and then to perform your analog. So, for instance, when you were looking at the, uh, the wind of a, a, a number of grid points, uh, would you think that first you look for the mean only over the full, uh, then about the uh, some uh, residual, and building the uh, analog on different uh, scale in time, for instance, for the mean, and uh, a different scale in time for the uh, residual. Mm. Okay, so... Uh, so it's a multi-scale forecast. Okay. Because uh, what's... Okay, so that's, that's my question. Just to say that here you have uh, still using this... Uh, this uh, that something that I didn't like. The metrics you, you use, but to help this metrics to decompose the signal mm -hmm. between uh, residual and mean. Okay, yeah, the, that could be. I think it, it, it should it should work for certain uh, systems. So the what you're saying is that uh, uh, we would use the, the the same metric, but we would uh, change the space uh, uh, the way we we. We uh, we would change the data before applying uh, analog forecasting, uh, and so, yes. Uh, in particular, to try to uh, to uh, to help based on a physical concept, the uh, the um, the dynamics. You you would expect the dynamical system for the the low resolution part would not be at the the same pace as the uh, the residual that would uh, be uh, more variable. Mm. And uh, since most of the time, and, and uh, you, you, you do know that uh, rapid fluctuation occur probably over a, a, a shorter distance, mm. you, you have a natural decomposition in any geophysical fluid 
to make between uh, different scale. Yes. So maybe that's uh, that's something to expand in your uh, forecast system to yes. compose about uh, scale. Yes. So that's uh, okay. So sorry for this was most uh, more a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, now uh, concerning the uh, I had a question and in my mind or somewhere since I'm more uh, uh, Fourier or wavelet guy, in my mind the best analog usually in a signal is the correlation function. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me if you retrieve such a such a natural uh, uh, analog first analog hmm. so uh, I at the end of my uh, PhD I did uh, uh, start to use analogs on uh, wave data hmm. and um, uh, maybe yes uh, Pierre you can try to show uh, so yes, I am not sure how it's behaving, but maybe uh, put a high number, uh, 100. And uh, okay. And now, yes, if you go at the end of uh, analog forecasting. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, so, so yes, uh, uh, in this example, we recovered uh, um, actually the 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 analog method which was working the best was uh, the the locally linear here, and uh, it is making a linear regression which is uh, uh, exactly uh, computing uh, correlations. So 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 for this example here and here we know that uh, also the extremes are related to the autocorrelation uh, function. Uh, for this example, it is uh, uh, what we get and. Um, but uh, but yes, so I have started to to see uh, what you're talking about on on this uh, data. Uh, yeah, that's the beginning of an answer. So and going back to the first comment I made, yes, I can repeat uh, the uh, uh, the uh, if you if you perform first a projection of your data into a, a scale space or space time scale. Then after that, you, you may imagine that you don't need necessarily to uh, to have the, the residual to be perfect, but maybe only the variance or their, their statistics. Mm. And on the low part, then you need to be uh, on, uh, on a more uh, deterministic uh, type of, uh, of uh, metrics, such as you, uh, you perform. So on one side, the, uh, the residual would be more interested on, on the uh, Variance or kurtosis or higher moment, you don't care where it's it's uh, where it is, and so maybe you okay. So I, I I think that in I hope that we will work together. Yes, we will, <laughs> and we will, and uh, I, I, we it could be a uh, uh, very helpful to try to look more on uh, on this uh, type of uh, improved metrics mm -hmm. on the uh, okay. Yes. So that's that's maybe uh, a comment as well as a prospective for, for future work. And uh, since I will uh, be uh, myself very excited by your subject, as well as the next uh, uh, perspective uh, future, I will let uh, Valérie uh, for the next question. And thank, thank you. you again for your, for your talk. Thank you very much, Bertrand. Yeah, thank you. So maybe oh, since... Uh, Your supervisor will uh, talk uh, now. So you had already a lot of questions, so I will mainly uh, give some comments. Uh, okay, I, all the, all the results you show in your talk and your document are not trivial, but when you explain, they sound very clear and very simple. And it is really impressive because uh, it means that you have a very deep understanding about uh, all the material you work with. Even it's uh, this material comes from very different scientific fields because you worked on physics, on 
methodology and statistics and so on. So congratulations for that uh, very impressive work. And I also really appreciate that in uh, statistics, we usually see a lot of uh, asymptotic results. And in your work, you give uh, results for a finite number of analogs and the fixed uh, lengths of the catalogs. So the results are really uh, interesting and open a lot of purpose perspectives for the applications. So I, I wanted to congratulate you for all that work. And I have maybe just a very short questions in the in your results, you usually, usually uh, suppose that uh, x0 and xt are in the same space. But uh, in some of your application, you could have uh, not an xt, but something like a yt, which could be in another uh, space. I give you an example. So when you want to detect if uh, there will be a too big wave, uh, that uh, impose to stop your turbine, for instance, you could just predict uh, a discrete variable, which is 0, 1, using analogs from uh, a space which uh, describes the waves. So if uh, your prediction or your forecast uh, is applied to a yt, let's say, does it change your results or not? Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, Valérie. Uh, uh, to answer your, your question, I will again ask uh, Pierre to change the slide. Uh, maybe if you go back to slide um, uh, 17, so, but I don't know what's going to happen, but let's... Okay, uh, again, it's, it's weird, but... Uh, uh, okay. Well, okay. Yes, go to to the end of uh, this one. Okay, uh, maybe just before, but yes, yes, uh, just before. Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, one way that I could answer this is that uh, uh, in uh, in uh, uh, the hypothesis that I make is that uh, so there are a, a very strong hypothesis. Uh, I assumed that uh, we have observations of the whole state. So uh, again, uh, as uh, Mr. Janakis said, it is a, um, it's a, a very strong hypothesis. But so what you could say is that uh, since in our result uh, here, the, the, the forecast, uh, the forecast here is a forecast of the whole state. So um, in our hypothesis, any uh, yt would be a function of xt. So if yt is a function of xt, and if uh, our uh, uh, xt hat is close to, to, to the real xt, uh, then f of xt hat will also be close to, to f of xt if uh, the function is uh, regular enough. So, so yes, so that's, that's how I can, uh, uh, answer your question, but uh, uh, I think definitely uh, there is a change of perspective uh, to be done uh, to so that uh, the work that I have done can be used in in a, a wider variety of uh, situations. And uh, I think it's, this, uh, this was my point at the end on this uh, observables uh, uh, framework uh, that should be should be used. Thank you. I have no more questions because it's quite late already. So now I will uh, give the floor to uh, Thierry Chauvenel. If you want to, to do some comments about your Thank work. you, Mrs. Mombe, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, like you, I would like to thank Paul for the quality of his presentation and of his manuscript, as well to his answers to the many questions uh, he, he had. I would like to thank 
the all the members of the jury for their contribution to the defense of Paul and to the to their questions to their comments. Uh, in particular, I would like to to thank the rapporteur uh, who who made uh, uh, what a, a hard work uh, for the thorough uh, reading of the manuscript. Um, as far as I am concerned, uh, often in PhD thesis, I am involved in the technical aspects, but here I was only involved uh, in the administrative support for this thesis. However, I could uh, see along these three years how well uh, Paul was able to, to cope with the difficulties of the, of the problems uh, involved by the challenging uh, studies he was uh, he was uh, considering um thus i will also uh, like to to thank the the technical uh, uh, supervisors uh, pierre jean francois uh, pascal and uh, uh, philippe for uh, their uh, their involvement in the work and for their uh, uh, shrewd uh, advice. Um, and also, I would like to say that I appreciated a lot your, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your spirit and uh, how helpful you have been, in particular, uh, dedicating time for teaching to our students. Uh, well, I, otherwise, I have no question, and I thank you uh, once again. Um, well, that's all for me, uh, Mrs. President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now the, the other supervisor, maybe uh, Philippe, you can start. Okay, so yeah, I could start. Um, well, um, I'm not, I mean, uh, of course, I'm very uh, impressed by the presentation and I would like to thank Paul, but I, I would like to, uh, to say that at the beginning of the PhD, um, uh, I thought, well, you know, uh, Paul has five advisors and so it's, it's like you know going to on the boat on the sea and have you know five directions you have to go and i think it was very challenging and uh, i really appreciate the fact that uh he was able to always to to set his own trajectory to work in a very independent matter and manner and so in some sense uh i think maybe i learned more from him than he learned from me <laughs> And so that was a uh, really nice, and also to work with uh, my colleagues in Brest and uh, at LSE, Pascal uh, was also a pleasure. So uh, I would like to thank everyone for that. So maybe Pascal. Yeah. Pascal, can you continue? <laughs> yes, I'll turn my uh, camera on microphone uh, back. So I was going to say something like uh, the same thing as uh, as Philippe, so I can uh, recall the, the story. Uh, uh, Paul came to to see us. Uh, that was more than uh, yes, only more than uh, three years ago, and uh, with a project, and uh, we decided that uh, we would uh, go go ahead. But uh, the, there was this uh, difficulty of being in Brest, uh, and uh, uh, Philippe and I were in uh, uh, near Paris, and uh, that was uh, a bit. Uh, tough uh, for you uh, of course and uh, the fact that there were four people with uh, a subject that um, uh, that was uh, clear at some times and uh, less clear at other times uh, made things uh, very uh, difficult for you and uh, i'm really impressed by the courage and your uh, your obstination uh, to uh, to do uh, to do your thesis and you did a lot of very interesting interesting things so what you showed in particular during your defense is really something that i've been wondering about especially on the uh, statistical uh, distribution of, of extremes so that's a real added value compared to what uh, i've done with people like david de faranda here or uh, some 
Alejandro Vianti, who is a mathematician uh, in Marseille, or and you you had the the the, the courage to uh, to go to see other people like Benoît Sosol uh, uh, in Brest, who is uh, who does uh, fundamental uh, mathematics. Uh, so you 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 reached a very broad range of of uh, topics around analogs, around uh, waves, uh, or. And uh, I'm really, I was really impressed by uh, the variety of results you you obtained in your uh, manuscript uh, during those uh, three years. So I must congratulate you for this because that was not easy. And the last months uh, with the, the COVID pandemic uh, made things even harder. And uh, when we rehearsed. Uh, uh, when you rehearsed for your presentation, I was uh, very uh, positively impressed by how you reacted uh, to our comments and how things uh, improved. Uh, so that's really uh, to your credit, uh, your courage and uh, your enthusiasm and uh, your creativity to reach uh, this point. So congratulations uh, in advance, uh, Paul. I'm Thank gone. you very much, Pascal and Philippe. Yes, sorry, uh, I missed my list. Yes, uh, maybe Jean-François, Filippo, you can uh, also add some comments. Okay, so this is Jean-François from France Energy Marine. So. Uh, uh, again, I would like to uh, thank uh, Paul and uh, congratulate him for his uh, nice piece of work in his PhD and an uh, excellent presentation today. And, uh, of course, as all of you, I'm very impressed by uh, how, how what he did. And uh, as uh, Philippe said, um, I also learned uh, much more from him than he learned from me. Um, <clears throat> uh, that being said, I would like also to say that he's a, a very talented scientist and that uh, unlike uh, Many talented scientists is also very talented in uh, expressing and explaining his results, and this is why I also learned so much from that PhD. Um, I would like also to say that uh, he really managed to do a, a PhD in terms that he it has some philosophic results. In terms, what I mean is that he really managed to go to the bottom of each of the question he, he was uh, uh, trying to tackle. And also um, that what he has done uh, really is a contribution that we try to expand in the FEM project. And we are a young institute, and I think um, um, this will be a first brick of a long-term thematics. So I would like to thank him for that. Thank you very much, Jean-François. Thank you. And now, uh, Pierre uh, Tandeo. Yes, I'm, I'm just in front of uh, of you, Paul. <laughs> you don't see me, uh, the others. But uh, yeah, so thank you again for, for your presentation. I, I think it was uh, very, very clear. Uh, the, the topic was not uh, so easy to, to explain, and you, you, you did it uh, very well. And I really appreciated your, your, your presentation. So congratulations for that. Uh, and I agree with you, Jean-François. Uh, I, I, I was, I have been very impressed during your your PhD uh, because you are able to manage theoretical aspects and also you are able to to work on a concrete problem, especially for uh, a problem for uh, at France Energie Marine. And this is something that uh, is is. Uh, it's difficult to find someone who is able to, to, to deal with both uh, aspects. And, and I think this is, uh, this is uh, your particularity. And, and I, I wanted to, uh, to focus on that. Um, uh, something that uh, is important, and you, you did it uh, very well, is uh, your integration uh, at EMT Atlantic at, uh, and at uh, France Energy Marine and also at uh, your last uh, lab uh, uh, in uh, LCE in, uh, close to Paris. I think you, you, you were able to, uh, to talk with everybody, uh, with the students, PhD students, postdocs, and also uh, with the researchers. 
so this you have a very good um, uh, I mean um, you have a very good feeling with with people and this is very important for for a team so you you have uh, everything uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, yes to conclude yeah you, uh, congratulations uh, for for all you did during, during your your thesis and i i hope uh, we will uh, work together in, in the future because uh, you you are um, uh, very good in, in research thank you thank you very much for